we're going to act like last week never happened. Um, and essentially start with the beginning of the Shakespeare material. Um, I'm not going to talk much about the, the background because um, I don't want us to get too far behind. And, and we can play with the um, schedule. I may just end up dropping Fahrenheit 451. We'll, uh, we'll see later. Um, but I do want us to at least, <coughs> depending on how long I'm able to talk to them, um, I do want us to at least get in, uh, some into A Midsummer Night's Dream um, today. A couple of comments in terms of the background for Shakespeare material. Anything that is in bold print other than the description about the two um, portraits that are on page 1535, anything that's in bold print I would be familiar with and I'm going to put up just a couple of things about his, uh, <coughs> about his biography that I think at least are important. <coughs> uh, Shakespeare was born, we think, or let me put it this way. The traditional date given for his birth is April 23rd. I say the traditional date because we don't know the exact date. Um, we have his baptismal record, which is, if I remember right, about a week later than that. And based upon the tradition or the custom at the time a child was baptized about a week after birth, so we assume that his date of birth was April 23rd, okay? Um, 1564, and then he dies on April 23rd, 1660. So he dies essentially on his birthday at the age of 52. <coughs> One of the interesting things about April 23rd is it's what's called the feast day of St. George. That is, St. George, a, a saint in the early Christian church, it's his patronal feast day. The only reason that's significant for us, or for this, is St. George is the patron saint of England. So here you have the greatest writer in the English language, born on the patron saint's day of, um, of England. You've got, you know, in the chronology, you've got stuff about his marriage to Anne Hathaway. He's 18, she's 26. Uh, about three months later, she gives birth to their eldest child, so it's a shotgun wedding. They don't get married, we know, in the town of Stratford-on-Avon because there's no record of it. If they had been married in Stratford, there would be a record of it, okay? Um, at that time, in order to get married, you had to have read <coughs> in church on the three consecutive Sundays to the marriage, what are called the bands. And all that is, is the rector slash priest would stand up in the church and say, if anyone has any good reason for why William Shakespeare should not marry Anne Hathaway, speak up now. Okay? And that would happen three consecutive Sundays prior to the wedding. Didn't happen to their, for their wedding. Um, pretty good reason why. One of the reasons you would stand up at this time period to do that is to say, um, I know, and it wasn't just she, it could be he also, I know he isn't a virgin because I slept with him, or I know she isn't a virgin because I slept with her, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Or I know she isn't a virgin because he slept with her. That would be cause in Elizabethan England. Um, the very fact that, you know, at the time of the wedding, she was probably out to here, okay? Um, would be another reason. But they weren't married in Stratford. They got married 
we're pretty sure in a town a couple counties over, okay? So they get married. She has her first child in 1583, okay? They're married in November of 1582, so, and she delivers uh, the daughter Susanna in February of 1583, so it's, I mean, it's pretty close, okay? And then two years later, they have twins, Hamlet and Judith, so he's got three children <coughs> in 1585, so, 1583, <clears throat> Susanna is born. 1585, Hamnet, not Hamlet, and Judith are born. And then very briefly, in 1585, Shakespeare seemingly falls off the face of the earth. What was he married against uh, Hamlet? 1582. He was 18 and she was 26. By the way, to be 26 and not married in the 1580s, that's like being 60 and not married today. I mean, old spinster-ish, okay? We don't know why. We don't know if she was deformed, you know, nothing, whatever. Um, <coughs> 1585, Shakespeare seemingly, as I said, drops off the face of the earth. What do I mean by that? We've got, you know, a little bit of documentary evidence from his birth, at least until this point. That is, we've got records of things happening, like the marriage, the baptism, his baptism, his children's births, etc., etc. From 1585 to 1592, we have no idea what Shakespeare's doing. Absolutely not. There's no record of him at all. Nothing mentions him. Why is that significant? Because in 1592, when he is first mentioned again, he's already a major playwright. He's already well-known in London. He's got people who are griping and grousing because they're jealous of him. Guys who have written lots of books, Shakespeare stole, essentially, the plot from one of them, from one of his early plays. Okay? There was no such thing as plagiarism in this day. The idea was, if you could take somebody's idea and make it better, more power to you. None of Shakespeare's plots in all of his 37 plays is original to him. He takes other material and he adds to it. He changes things around. He adds characters. He removes characters. That is, he does what every author does, what every artist does. He takes materials that are already out there, like colors, it rearranges them. It's just that nobody, for example, with painting, nobody rearranged the colors the way a Renoir did, or a Picasso did, or a, a um, pick your famous painter did. Okay, it's just they came up with a new way of portraying it. Well, Shakespeare does essentially the same thing, and nobody else did it the way he did it before. Okay, so those seven years are usually called something like the lost years. <clears throat> and if you could find, if you could prove, prove, like beyond the shadow of a doubt, like courtroom prove, if you could prove what Shakespeare was doing in those days, if, if you were to be rummaging around in some library or in some manor house in England that had a bunch of records from the late 16th century, and you found evidence of what Shakespeare was doing, you would be internationally famous. You'd be on, literally, every major evening newscast because nobody knows for sure. There's all kinds of theories. Some people believed, thought, early, um, uh, not critics, but thinkers kind of said this, that Shakespeare was a schoolmaster. He was a headmaster in a school. <coughs> Would be kind of interesting if he was, because we have no indication that says Shakespeare ever attended university. In fact, what we do believe is the highest he ever attended in terms of schooling would be the equivalent, modern day equivalent in terms of numbering, of like sixth grade grammar school. Differences, 
at the end of a sixth grade grammar school education in Shakespeare's day, that would be equivalent to, at the very least, like a high school diploma today. Probably close to a bachelor's degree because of how he would have been taught, which I'll talk about very briefly in a moment. Okay? So, headmaster of the school, traveling actor. Very likely he was doing that, at least towards the later period, okay? Writing plays. Yeah, probably. Probably working on ideas, okay? Because, again, we know in 1592, when he's first referred to, he's already got three or four plays going on in London at the time. We think the earliest of those plays, Comedy of Errors, probably dates from about 1588, 1589. Okay? But we don't know for sure. All right? What else? Um, then he traveled Europe. He, he did what's called the, you know, in, in modern English, they call it the gap year. When you finish high school and you go off to college. Or when you finish college and before you go off to, you know, a real job. Then he traveled Europe. Why? <coughs> One, he's pretty familiar with European customs. That is French customs, German customs. Italian customs, etc. Two, he had to know French and he had to know Italian because a couple of his sources were only available in French and Italian at the time that he writes his plays. Right? Now, where's Shakespeare from? He's from the little town of Stratford on Avon, which is about 80 miles. If, if this is London here, if you're looking at a map, and I'm the map, if this is London here, Stratford on Avon's up here. It's about 30, 40 miles beyond Oxford. So what does that really mean? Think of the United States. What's the quote-unquote cultural capital of the United States? Louder? New York. Probably would be it. Some people would say L.A., Hollywood. Eh. New York's got better museums and libraries and stuff. But probably New York. So what would Stratford-on-Avon be to New York? Syracuse, maybe? You guys are thinking geographically. I want you to think culturally. It'd be like Woodbury. Okay. Oh, Cannon County Center for the Arts. Woo! Right? I mean, Stratford on Avon's Podunkville. It is nothing. Okay. And here's this guy who's from there who shows up in London, and now his plays are commanding major audiences. The Globe Theater fit about 3,000 people. Excuse me. The theater, as it was called then, fit about 3,000 people. And we're pretty sure, based upon anecdotal evidence, we have diaries written by people who attended Shakespeare's plays. They talk about the plays they've seen, etc. And we have, you know, receipt accounts of the theater. We... We pretty much know when Shakespeare's plays were on, it was packed. It was literally standing room only because of how the theater was shaped. Like this, you've got the stage. Around the stage, you have galleries. <coughs> that is, you have a first level, second level, third level. Out here, this is called the pit or the yard. Okay? So you've got three levels of seating here, and then you have this. Well, this holds about 500 people. They pay a penny. These people are called groundlings. Okay? The people who paid a penny to stand here were generally the people who didn't have a higher education or any education. And they were paying a penny to kill some time. They would bring food with them. While we know while the plays were going on, they would relieve themselves right there, drop their shorts, etc. Okay? And if they didn't like the play, what was on the ground, go with what I just said, could get scooped up and thrown at the people on the stage. So you're a playwright and actor. What have you got to do? You've got to appeal to both the people who are paying relatively big bucks up here. People who are smart, who are quote-unquote intellectual, who read, and you've got to appeal to the people down here. 
any difference from our society today in terms of TV? Nope. You got to appeal to the highbrow and the lowbrow. Well, Shakespeare can do the same. But again, from what we know, he backed the price. In fact, there was a box over here that was reserved for the queen. The queen liked Shakespeare. Okay? So, this is kind of his background. He writes, well, let's just take the 52 for a moment. In his 52 years, he writes 37 full length plays on his own. That is, these aren't aided by anybody else. There's a couple other plays that we know he assists a couple of other authors. So some texts will say he writes 39 plays. 37 full length plays, four very long poems, like over 500 words each. Uh, excuse me, over 500 lines each. Okay. And 154 sonnets. You'll see when we do poetry, sonnets are 14-line uh, poems. You do the math. 154 times 14. Bare minimum, that's over 2,000 more lines of poetry. <coughs> but he doesn't write that in 52 years. He writes that, let's say, 1588. Let's take that date I said that possibly for his earliest play. Okay, Take that date to when we know he stops writing. 1612. So 12 and 12, it's 24 years. In 24 years. Just skip all this stuff. Just go with these. Just 37 plays in 24 years. <coughs> It averages out to what? It's about a play and a half a year. And these aren't little one-act plays. These aren't little plays that can be done in 30 minutes. These aren't little plays that can be done in two hours. The shortest Shakespeare play, Macbeth, takes about two and a quarter, two and a half hours to produce if you do the entire play. The longest which is either Hamlet or King Lear, takes a good three and a half to four hours. That's why you will almost never see an entire production of Hamlet. They often will condense, they'll, they'll remove parts. Okay? Same thing with King Lear. All right? Because they're long, long plays. They did have intermissions in Shakespeare's day, but again, I mean, you imagine. If you're sitting here, you're sitting on hard wooden seats, benches, essentially, for four hours. Okay? It's, it's not like going to Tucker Theater or Boutwell, nice pat, you know, cushioned and, and all that kind of stuff. So he's churning it out. I mean, he's like a modern day hack writer, like a John Grisham or Danielle Steele or J.D. Robb or something like that, just turning out one thing after another. And yet, what kind of works are these? They're Shakespeare. Meaning, none of it's easy. None of it's crap. Some of it's, in terms of Shakespeare, kind of crap. But even Shakespeare's crap is better than 95% of what everybody else is writing at the time. Okay? <clears throat> All right. That's, I don't want to say anything else about the um, background. He dies, as I said, in 1616. This is kind of important. In 1623, you have what's called the first folio produced. The first folio is the first collected edition of Shakespeare's plays. Okay. Prior to the first folio, a lot of Shakespeare's plays have been produced, but not a lot of them have been printed. If it weren't for the first folio, we would not have over half of Shakespeare's plays, because it's the first place that they're printed. Why right, it's pretty important. What's interesting is that it's not printed until seven years after he dies. It's printed by his friends, his fellow playwrights in the acting company that he was, uh, excuse me, his fellow actors in the acting company he was part of, all right? But seven years go by. Now, I have to throw this out. There are a group of people called the Anti-Stratfordians. These are people who say Shakespeare 
from Stratford on Avon did not write the plays. Somebody else did. But they were attributed to him. And they, they come up with a variety of what they consider to be evidence that Shakespeare didn't write the plays. And one of those pieces of evidence is, how come when he died, nobody immediately praised him? Nobody immediately started writing, you know, memorial poems about his death. Because we have other people who died at about the same time who when they die, people write little books of poetry celebrating what a wonderful poet this person was. And they were nothing compared to Shakespeare. So why does it take seven years? Well, according to the anti stratfordians this is all part of the conspiracy. Because the, the Shakespeare who died in 1616 wasn't really the author of the plays. Okay? What kind of other evidence do they give for that? One. Shakespeare never attended university. And only somebody who attended the university, Oxford or Cambridge, could have written these plays. That's the elitist attitude. Only a university student could have written these kinds of plays. Why? Because of the depth of feeling, because of the, the intellectual nature of the ideas. Only somebody who's been to college could have written those. Okay? Um, what else? The person, this kind of relates to that, to that one, the person who wrote these things had such a good education. And you couldn't have gotten that by going through six years of grammar school. Okay? That's largely a modern idea. You have to understand what six years of grammar school in Shakespeare's day would have meant. He probably would have started around the age five, six at the latest, and would have gone through 11 or 12. Okay? He would have learned during that period both Latin and some Greek, classical Greek, like to be able to read Plato and Aristotle and Homer in the original. Okay? He would have had some of that. Not a lot, but some. Enough to where he could pick up an edition of the Iliad or the Odyssey. Excuse me, not the Iliad. Uh, yeah, the Iliad, or the Odyssey, and read that on his own, in original Greek, okay? Latin, he would have been really adept in. How adept? Well, in terms of both Latin and Greek, Shakespeare's understanding, take Shakespeare out, a grammar school student who left school at, at the age of 11 or 12, who started at 5 or 6, would have finished with as much Latin and Greek understanding as a modern-day college student who majors in classics. MTSU doesn't have a major in classics, but Sewanee does. So, an 11 or 12-year-old would have walked out of that schooling with as much, quote-unquote, classics information in terms of understanding of the languages as that student who graduates from Sewanee in classics. Why? Because pretty early on, let's say by mid, midway through, here's one of the things they would have done as part of the teaching program. You would be given a text, a page of, for example, um, Caesar's Gallic Wars, Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars. Okay? It's pretty straightforward Latin. Right? You'd be given that in Latin. And you'd be asked to take your slate, because that's what they would have written on, Put it down next to it. Translate Caesar's Latin into your modern English. You begin a certain amount of time, so you translate that passage into modern English. Okay? Then the original Latin would be taken away. Then you'd be told, take another slate, translate your modern English translation of Caesar's Gallic Wars, that page, back into Latin. It had to match perfectly in order for it to be considered approved or correct. And this is back in the period where if it was wrong, if it was bad, wham, you get smacked. Usually over the knuckles. Why? Because that's what's doing the writing. It's a it's a pretty good pain, it's a pretty good motivational technique. Okay? That's why, you know, athletes, it works. So imagine doing that multiple times a year 
you get to where you can think and dream in that language. That's the kind of background Shakespeare would have had. Right? <coughs> what else? What are other reasons? We have no manuscript materials in Shakespeare's handwriting. Almost none. That is, we don't have a copy of any of the poems in Shakespeare's own handwriting. We do have for a lot of other poets of the period, but not Shakespeare. Why not? And I start forwarding say, because it wasn't him. Now, usually, these people fall into a couple groups. One of the big ones is, and it's a, it's a group with a bunch of different kind of categories in it. They are related to the person who they want to suggest was the original author. The Earl of Oxford, Francis Bacon, characters like that. If you saw the film Anonymous, that's what this was all about. That Shakespeare was a Shakespeare, <coughs> etc. Okay? The vast majority of Shakespeare scholars say this is a bunch of hooey. This is crazy. It's, it's, it's not good evidence. It's not good scholarship. It's not good argument. That there are enough reasons to assert the Shakespeare Stratford and Avon is the Shakespeare who wrote the plays. One of those reasons, there's all kinds of what are called Warwick-isms, dialectal characteristics. Like I said, you know, Stratford on Avon would be like Woodbury. Woodburyisms in the language. There's terms, phrases, etc., words that are found in Warwickshire, which is where Stratford is, that aren't used in London that are in the plays. That's a pretty good giveaway that probably whoever wrote the plays was using a Warwickshire dialect. Okay? <coughs> All right. That aside, let's jump into Midsummer Night's Dream. Look, take that back. Not jump into, but let's start a Midsummer Night's Dream. Okay? So again, you got all the different, you know, bold-faced terms. And you have some really, really good. I, I highly recommend you kind of read it and pay attention to it. Page 15, 15, 1544 and 45. A note on reading Shakespeare. Okay? <coughs> Keep track of the characters, etc. Remember, poetic language deserves to be read slowly, carefully. This is not old English, by the way. You'll, you'll see newspaper articles, you know, Shakespeare wrote in old, no, we didn't. Shakespeare wrote in our English. It's just slightly different. Slightly different. It is, when I say our English, he's writing what is called early modern English, but it's modern English. Old English would be like the, the language of the old English poem Beowulf, okay? Which, here's, here's a portion of Old English. This is the Lord's Prayer. Fader ure thuth the ert on heavenum, seeth the nama yehalagod. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So those two lines. Notice, that's totally different from modern English. Shakespeare's would be, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The vowels would be slightly different, okay? But it's pretty much our English. One other thing, and I'm not going to talk any more about the other stuff there. If you can, without feeling self-conscious, without bothering people around you, when you read Shakespeare, or when you read the material by Sophocles, and then you're going to think I'm totally crazy. Try to read it aloud. For the simple reason, it's meant to be heard. It's meant to, These plays are not meant to be read in silence. These are not what your text called closet dramas. These are meant to be performed. You are meant to see these. Shakespeare, an awful lot of the quote-unquote meaning of the play is visual and oral. You have to hear it and see it in order to get it. There's an awful lot, for example, of puns. Puns, plays on language. Shakespeare is an amazingly dirty playwright. 
there's a there's a lot of risque stuff. Okay, and some directors want to emphasize that more than anything. Why? Because they think, oh, this will get the audience's attention. Well, it's kind of dumbing down by making everything blatant and overt because Shakespeare couldn't make it blatant and overt in his own day. He would have been censored. Censorship in Shakespeare's day was not like censorship of our day where people say, oh, I don't want to hear that. No, there were actual censors and you could have things like your tongue cut out. Queen Elizabeth was the number one censor. People wrote things against her. She had tongues cut out. She had hands cut off. Stops them from writing. Okay? So, we don't see that in Midsummer Night's, Midsummer Night's Dream. Midsummer Night's Dream, about 1595. So it's fairly early when you think of, you know, he shows up in London, 1592. And the reason you're reading this play, and the reason this play is included in your textbook, is because it's probably the most popular of all of Shakespeare's plays. Hamlet might be better known, but A Midsummer Night's Dream is more popular. You cannot go, for example, to London in the summer, summer defined middle of May, end of August, and not be able to see A Midsummer Night's Dream somewhere. It, it's constantly going on. Okay? Other than the years in England when the playhouses were closed for things like plague or the you know the Puritans and such, uh, there's pretty good evidence that suggests Midsummer Night's Dream has always been produced somewhere. Okay, and it's because it's one of Shakespeare's funniest plays because of a couple of the characters. So, page 1546 and 47, you get the dramatis personae, that is the list of characters. Okay. And I'll go over these very, very quickly. You have Theseus, Duke of Athens. Where is Athens? Greece. Okay. Um, Theseus is a quote-unquote real character in cultural history. What do I mean by that? Not necessarily that he actually lived, but he's a figure... He's an important figure in Greek mythology. He's a well-known hero, in other words. Kind of like Achilles or Hercules. Achilles and Hercules didn't really live, but they you know, are very big in the kind of cultural consciousness, so to speak. So Theseus, Duke of Athens. Hippolyta, Queen of the Amazons. Now, it used to be thought Amazons. Total myth. Okay? And if you saw Wonder Woman, you know, that's what she is. Um, I can't remember her first name. Prince. Whatever her first name is. Um, an archaeological discovery last year of a couple women burials, 3000 BC, if I remember right, and what is modern, or what was Scythia, northern, north of Greece and such. Women warriors, I mean warriors like the burial, armed to the teeth. Okay, We're pretty sure there was a real quote-unquote race of Amazons. Now, whether they did what the Amazons were attested to have you know, done, defeated, enslaved men, all that kind of stuff, no idea. What, what's the defining characteristic of Amazons? Louder. Strong. Strong fierce. How fierce were they in terms of warriors? What were they especially good at? Bow and arrow, archery. Here's how crazy the Amazons were, according to myth. If they were right-handed, they would cut off their left breast so that when they pulled that bow back, it's not going to hit. That's some serious, you know, warrior mentality right there, okay? So, Theseus, Hippolyta, queen of the Amazons, betrothed to Theseus. We're going to find out in the Opian lands. Why is she betrothed to him? Because he defeated her in battle, okay? Philostrate, master of revels, not very important. Aegeus, father of Hermia. He's only going to be important 
because she doesn't want her daughter to marry who she wants to marry. Major, major, major theme throughout almost all of Shakespeare's plays, whether comedy or tragedy. Okay? And then you have Hermia, Aegeus' daughter. She's in love, notice, with Lysander. So, <coughs> Hermia, Lysander. He's just a great guy who's in love with her. Okay? So, Lysander in love with Hermia. So notice, they go together where they should. Then you have Demetrius. In love with Hermia and favored by Aegeus. So, he loves her, but notice she doesn't love him. Okay? Then you have Helena, and she's in love with Demetrius. Notice we're told Demetrius is favored by Aegeus. That means Aegeus wants Demetrius to marry his daughter Hermia. Okay? Then you have Oberon, king of the fairies, Titania, queen of the fairies, and then you have the <coughs> then you have Puck or Robin Goodfellow and a bunch of other little minor fairies. And then we have another group of humans. Okay? So you have the upper class, the Duke, the Queen of the Amazons, and then this aristocracy, Hermia, Demetrius, Helena, Lysander. Fairies. And then you have lower class humanity. Okay? Peter Quince, Carpenter, Nick Weaver, Nick, Nick Bottom of Weaver, Francis Flute, Bellows Mender, etc., etc. These guys are going to put on a play later on in the play, which is what gives this play 95% of its humor. Okay? So notice from the outset, from what the dramatis personae tells us, where is there going to be conflict? I don't have his name up here. I'll put it up now. Aegeus, father of Hermia. Okay? Well, it's going to be here. Because these two are in love with each other. He loves her. He supports him. There's going to be a problem with that relationship. Okay? And we, we're not told in the Dramatis Persona, but it comes out very early in the play. One of the reasons she's in love with him is because before he fell in love with her, he quote-unquote courted her. The play's going to say he made love to Helena. It doesn't mean what we mean by that. It doesn't mean he had sex with her. It means he wooed her. He won her heart. So she falls in love with him. And then the dirty turns around and dumps her for Hermia. Okay? One other point. We're not told anything in the Dramatis Persona, but it will come out in the course of the play a description about these two characters. Okay? Shut up, sorry. Um, Helena should be tall, lithe, willowy, and probably blonde. Hermia should be relatively short, somewhat dark skinned, definitely dark hair. Because Hermia is going to express jealousy over Helena's looks. Both her fairness, the whiteness of her skin, and her height. Hermia has a chip on her shoulder about the size of El Capitan about being short. She is a short woman and she doesn't like it. Okay? So, the play opens. Play opens. Theseus and Hippolyta come in, and they're talking about what is about to happen in a few days. Now fair Hippolyta, our nuptial hour, draws on apace. Four happy days bring in another moon. But oh, methinks how slow this old moon wanes. She lingers my desires like to a step up above. And she says, yeah, don't worry about it. Four days will quickly steep themselves in night. Okay? Steep. We only use that verb 
in one way today. If you're making tea, you steep the tea in boiling water. Okay? What's she saying? These four days will what? They'll quickly go away. They're thinking four days from now, man, we get married. You gotta put yourself in this mindset. No sex before marriage. More or less. Okay? So four days, man. Four days. Come on. And he's going, oh, the days are draining by slow. She's like, don't worry, it'll go by soon enough. Okay? So Theseus tells Philostrate to go stir up the Athenian youth. Why? Because the day we get married, we want to have a party. We want them to put on some, some festive activities for us. Okay? So Aegeus comes in with his daughter. Now, notice what immediately happens. They're talking about their upcoming wedding day. And Theseus comes in to say, my daughter wants to marry him, but I want her to marry him. They're talking about marriage too, only what is Aegeus playing in the marriage, proposed marriage. He's the stumbling block. So the Duke and Queen, they're talking about, we're getting married, we're looking forward to it, it's going to be a wonderful day. And then somebody else comes in and says, I'm going to stop this other marriage. Dad immediately kind of, you know, casts a stain on this idea of marriage. Okay? So Aegeus <coughs> tells his daughter to stand forth. He tells Demetrius to stand forth. And he says, this man, line 25, hath my consent to marry her. Okay? Why is that important? Yeah, because in 2020, for most people, it's not important anymore whether or not the father gives the blessing. Or to many people, it's not. Okay? In ancient Greece, what were women considered to be? Property. 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 She was his to do with as he wished. So he could give her to him or to him. Or to him, or to him, or to whoever he wanted. Yes, daddy. That's it. Okay? And then he tells Lysander, you stand forth. He says, this man bewitched the bosom of my... Bewitched. He's pulled a false one. A fast one on her. He has done something to her mind so that she's not thinking rationally. Okay? And he says... <coughs> how he's bewitched her. He's given her things. Okay? And I think Shakespeare's giving us a little clue here into how people, quote-unquote, courted in his day. You give letters, you give cards, you give, you know, bouquets of flowers, etc., etc. And he hath turned her obedience, skipping a few lines, go down to 37, which is due to me to stubborn her. She ought to obey me. So, he says, my gracious Duke, if she won't marry here right now before you, that is, agree to marry, not this very moment, I beg the ancient privilege of Athens. <coughs> and he tells us what that privilege is. If she is mine, I may dispose of her. Which shall be, here's how I'm going to dispose of her. Either she marries Demetrius or she dies. That's pretty severe, right? Ladies, put yourself in you know, her shoes. Dad says, I marry this guy I don't have any feelings for, her, or I die. Theseus, okay, Hermia, what do you have to say? Notice Theseus in saying that. He's kind of giving her an out. He's not saying, uh, you can choose door number three. But he is saying, what do you say? He's actually treating her, first of all, like a human, not just a piece of property. Come on, your father should be as a god to you. Demetrius is a worthy gentleman. And she goes, so is Lysander. Yeah, you're right, he is. Except he lacks your father's voice. 
he doesn't have your father's assent. So, he says, therefore the other must be held worthier. I would my father but look with my eyes. Now that's dangerous language. Why? He's call she is calling her father wrong and saying, look through my eyes, but my, my point of view. Okay. What else? I mean, yeah, that's true. How does she look at Lysander? Love. She's saying, I wish my father looked at Lysander the way I look at him. I mean, you could go all homosexual stuff there. And a lot of critics do. Do we have any background on why the dad just absolutely hated Lysander? Nope. It's totally capricious. Right? So. <coughs> rather your eyes must with this. Okay, so she says, okay, fine. You're not going to go with me. Okay, so what's the worst I can expect? Okay. Tell me the worst that can befall me. Um, and he kind of says, to die the death or to abjure forever the society of men. Notice, she says, if I don't marry Demetrius, what has he just done? He's changed what Aegeus asks for. Either she marries Demetrius or she dies. He's offered the third door. Either you die or you forever say goodbye to the society of men. That is, you become a nun. Not a Christian nun, because this is pre-Christian times. He goes on and says, you go off to the nunnery for those who worship Diana, the goddess of chastity. Of virginity. Okay? And you will do what then? Live a barren sister all your life. Chanting, this is 72 and following. Chanting faint hymns to the cold, fruitless moon. Notice, these are faint. They're, yay, Diana, princess of chastity. Yay. Why are they faint? Because you can't have a full-throated, hearty, singing in praise of no sex the rest of life. Thrice blessed they are that undergo such, you know. But no, you're going to die a virgin. She says, okay, yeah, I'll choose that one. Before I yield my virgin patent up to him, I'm not going to give it away to Demetrius. He said, no, 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 you don't have to answer me now. Tell you what, I'll give you four days. So what's the upshot of that? What's happening in four days? They're getting married in four days, he and Hippolyta. What could happen in four days, theoretically? The very day they're wed, he might have to put her to death. Now, put yourself in Hippolyta's shoes. It's the wedding night. You're supposed to consummate your marriage with your husband. You are the queen of the Amazons. Who did the Amazons fight for, if nobody else? Women! And your husband just put to death a poor girl because she wouldn't give it up to some guy she didn't love. You think Theseus is going to get lucky that night, or the next night, or any other night? Probably not. Okay? So Demetrius begs Hermia to relent, and he asks Lysander, come on, give it up to me. He says, you have your, her father's love, Demetrius. Let me have Hermia's. In other words, Aegeus loves you, and let Hermia love me. Why don't you and Aegeus go over there? Homosexuality was common. It was rampant in ancient Greece. Women were thought sexually necessary for one thing. Obviously, that's what? Kids. <laughs> Children. You got to reproduce, you know, the people. But homosexual relations between men, that's kind of what was thought to be the highest ideal, according to some thinkers, at least. Okay? So, Lysander finally speaks. <coughs> How does he argue to Theseus? He says, Lord, 
Look at Demetrius and look at me. I am as well derived. That is, I have as good a family background as he does. What it really means is, I have a high family standing. My name goes way back, like Kennedy. Okay? We go way back. What else? I'm as well possessed. I've got loads in the bank. I'm rich. Here's something he doesn't. My love is more than his. My fortune's every way is fairly marked. That is, fortune has smiled on me just as equally as it has on him. And what's more, she loves me. That should count for something. So he says, all things being equal, I'm more equal. And then he pulls his ace. Oh, and by the way, he made love to Nader's, Nader's daughter, Helena, and won her soul. Well, that's not been introduced before. And Theseus said, yeah, I heard about that. I meant to talk to him about that. So here's Helena standing off to the side, just looking slobbering after Demetrius. And Lysander says, he loved her first. And now she loves him, and he's turned his back on her. Whereas we loved each other always. Let us marry. Okay? So, the Duke goes off with his soon-to-be wife and Aegeus. Okay? And Demetrius, because he says to Demetrius, I, I, I want to talk to you about this. Okay? And we're left with Lysander and Hermia. Okay? And Lysander and Hermia... Do what? They talk about it. They don't do it yet. They talk about it. <coughs> Why are they going to run off into the woods? Skip the ball in. Okay? Why else? We have two settings, right? We've got Athens... And we've got the wood. Why are they going to go off into the wood? No law. No law. Athens is where law, civilization, order reigns. The woods? Chaos. There's no order. There's no rule. There's no law in the woods. Lysander says specifically, we can go off to the woods, and the reach of Athenian law can't touch us. We can go off there. I have a rich dowager aunt. She loves me. <laughs> he says, and we can live there the rest of our lives. No problem. Does mean they can never come back to Athens, because once they step back in Athens, what happens? Law, man, comes down like a ton of bricks. So they'll have to stay out of Athens. And she says, Cool. I'll do it. Okay. What complication does Hermia then create? She's outside door. What else? Who does she tell? She doesn't tell Demetrius. <coughs> she tells Helena. <coughs> and Helena tells Demetrius. So Helena tells Demetrius, because she knows Demetrius will go off in the forest. She's going to go off after Demetrius in the forest. So the next thing that we essentially see, after scene two, okay, is act two. We'll talk about scene two very, very briefly on Wednesday. But it's act two, which is now in the woods. Act one is all in Athens. Act two through four, most of four, are all in the woods. Okay. And what, again, characterizes the woods? Chaos. Chaos. Okay. We'll try to do all of Act 2 and part of Act 3 on Wednesday. <coughs> Expect a quiz on Wednesday. Let's say over Acts 1 and 2. Major characters, major plot kind of stuff. 
and some of the background stuff that I discussed today. Ten questions, maybe five extra credit. 